Paul Ehrlich, infamous author of The Population Bomb, once said, if I were a gambler, I would take even money that England will not exist in the year 2000. He said this in 1969, but it sounds eerily similar to the doom and gloom headlines that we see everywhere today. As parents, we want our kids to thrive long after we're gone. But what kind of world are we leaving them? Should we be concerned? Is disaster right around the corner? Well, today's guest, Marion Tupi, doesn't think so. He's the editor of humanprogress.org, a project that publishes data from reliable sources about the long-term trends in human well-being. His new book, Superabundance, takes a deep dive into two of these trends. Does higher population mean less resources? Are we really gonna run out of stuff? There are problems that we encounter all the time when uh, human progress takes a bit of a knock. And right now, in uh, 2022, Obviously, the world is suffering from a lot of maladies that we didn't foresee two years ago. That being said, long-term trends. This is where progress is undeniable, both materially, but also morally. In a world dominated by fear that's driving our kids to unprecedented levels of anxiety and depression, Marion's research offers a powerful, optimistic vision of human progress. That also happens to be true. And right now, all of us could use a little more good news. And Tupi, welcome to Dad Saves America. Thanks for having me. So I'm very excited to have you on the show today because one of the fundamental themes here at Dad Saves America is optimism, rational optimism. Our kids are bombarded by negativity and sort of apocalyptic thinking in the media. I call it the fear industrial complex. And so the work you do at Human Progress and your upcoming book, Superabundance, is a really great pushback and a rational pushback against this sort of psychology that's driving our kids to anxiety and depression and, and, and all kinds of problems. So I guess my first question is, are we actually making progress? You know, the world's pretty scary right now. You got war and inflation and threats of food shortages in the fall from wheat and Ukraine. There's all kinds of stuff that, that is pretty scary. So I guess I would like to start by saying that progress, the way we measure it, the way we define it, the way we, the way we understand it, does not mean that everything is optimal for everyone everywhere at all times. That would not be progress, as Steven Pinker likes to say. That would be miracle. Um, it's also important to understand that the graph line, if you will, of human progress, whilst it is going upwards, it is not smooth, but jagged. There are problems uh, that uh, we encounter all the time when uh, human progress takes a bit of a knock. And right now, in uh, 2022, obviously the world is suffering from a lot of maladies that we didn't foresee two years ago. Yeah. One was COVID, then of course the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine, and the economic consequences of COVID. That being said, what human progress does, and also what superabundance, the book, does, is to look over the long run. It looks at long-term trends. And this is where progress is undeniable, both materially, which I think that the audience will understand instinctively, but also morally. So let me look at them um, in turn. Great. The human species is about 300,000 years old, the Homo sapiens. Um, the, the clevier part of Homo sapiens, which we call Homo sapiens sapiens, is about 200,000 years old. What does that mean, real quick? Because I've actually never heard that before. A smart man, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> or an intelligent man. Um, by which, of course, I include women as well, needless to say. Um, now, for millennia, for hundreds of thousands of years, the scope of technological progress is very difficult to, uh, to register. And whilst there are occasional technological breakthroughs that happen, it does not galvanize just general technological and scientific progress that results in very rapid growth in, in GDP. It is only in the last 200 years, let's say since the middle of the 18th century, that the world has experienced a massive increase in GDP per capita. Now, that GDP per capita was driven not just by trade, but also, very importantly, by scientific and technological breakthroughs. And some people might say, well, you know, who cares about GDP per capita? Well, you should care about GDP per capita because GDP, the size of the economy, uh, the wealth that the economy produces, then gets translated into things like 
better sewage systems, which are important if you don't want to die of typhus. Right. They produce uh, better hospitals and more sophisticated uh, medical treatments, such as coming up with a COVID vaccine within a year. They allow children who previously had to work on farms to now go to schools and obtain an education. So this sort of material progress is, I don't think, very controversial. But we make an extra claim, which is to say that human beings have grown more moral or better over time. And that also can be measured. For example, hmm. chattel slavery has been around since the growth of agriculture and cities, civilizations, about 12,000 years ago. Slavery was present in ancient Egypt, obviously Greece and Rome, Aztecs, Mayas, oh, wherever you look. And roughly 200 years ago, again, that 18th century is a remarkable break with the past. We started thinking that all human beings deserve dignity and slavery was consequently abolished. That has never occurred to our ancestors before. Why did that aha moment that people have dignity happen? Because it's not like objectively you're, you look around the world or you look at people in your neighborhood and say, oh, we're all exactly the same. We all deserve to be treated the same. Like everybody's different. Some people are greedier than others. Some people are smarter than others or not as smart. Certainly physical strength and physical characteristics are obviously observably different. So how, how do we get that yeah. like it's, it's, universal dignity thing to happen? Well, it's not just that we all look different, but also that uh, in the previous eras, you became wealthier, not through trade or through innovation. My point is that most of the growth today is happening through innovation, but through conquest. If your little tribe uh, or your nation uh, wanted to become richer, in the absence of innovation, what you did, you went and conquered other people and you took their stuff and their women. And then the question was, what are you going to do with all these people? And you really only had two options. One is to kill them, all males, which is was, what was the preferred way of dealing with conquered people or you enslave them. There were no prisons, as we understand them today. Prison is a yeah. very new concept. Prison until maybe 200 years ago was just a holding cell before you got executed. So conquering peoples either killed everyone they conquered or they enslaved them. I think that the abolishment of slavery, to just give one example of moral progress, is partly a result of changing attitudes and new ideas that have started to spring up in human consciousness in uh, the, the 18th century. And one of them uh, had, to, and it was really the question of the enlightenment, enlightenment happening in Western Europe, where people started coming up with ideas that were previously unknown. One of them, for example, was Adam Smith, the founder of modern economics, Scottish economist, who wrote The Wealth of Nations. He was a great opponent of slavery, in part because it went against his moral judgment, but because he also thought that um, uh, free people are more productive people than enslaved people which I think is absolutely true. But there were other aspects to the Enlightenment, and one of them was humanism, this notion that all peoples deserved the same dignity. Where did it come from? It came from just a general progression of ideas that coalesced around these Enlightenment thinkers in, in the 18th century. And the notion was that every human being had a certain amount of worth, and it didn't matter whether you were black or white or man and woman, you deserved the same basic dignity. I have to also give due credit to Christianity because of course the early opponents of slavery were Quakers and right. they were driven uh, to their opposition to slavery due to uh, their particular interpretation of the Bible. Now Bible of course has been there for a very long time, but it took this particular sect to start to interpret the Bible in a way that galvanized the opposition to slavery. But slavery was not the only moral progress. We used to burn witches. Uh, we no longer do that as a general practice. People used to expose children who were born alive if the father, who usually had the, the, the pater familias, had power of life and death over the family, decided that he didn't like the child, that he couldn't afford the child, or he was suspicious that the child was born as a result of infidelity. Uh, the child would be put on a mountainside and be either taken by others or it die of exposure or be eaten by wild animals and things like that. We no longer do that. Uh, human sacrifice. Um, yeah. I've just been to Mexico City uh, about two weeks ago and I went to these magnificent ruins of an ancient Aztec civilization. 
Every year they would take five to seven year old children and sacrifice them on the top of a temple in order to ensure rain. Right. We no longer do yeah. that. And, and you can extend that much further. You can even say that when it comes to our treatment of animals, we are much, much more civilized. People used to have fun watching, you know, nailing cats to a, uh, to a wooden pole and then pelting it with stones and fruit to see how loud it would squeal. So in all of these ways, human beings are uh, also, I think, more gentle, more civilized, more moral. It is always shocking to be reminded of just how barbaric human beings have been throughout Throughout Absolutely. history? Absolutely. I mean, the, the, to me, the study of history is the most important thing because it shows you how far we have come in an extraordinarily short period of time. So if you think of our species as being 300,000 years old, modernity is roughly 0.08% of our time on Earth. So in that tiny sliver of time, we were able to build a uh, not, not just a technologically sophisticated society, but also richer and also more moral. And that's something to be reminded of and also to try to discern lessons from history, why that happened, so that we can perpetuate these kinds of progresses uh, into the future. So what is superabundance? You, you called your book superabundance. That's like a, that's not a commonly used term. So what does that mean? I, I guess um, we have to start a little bit back. And that starts with human concern over population growth and natural resources. Does population growth make natural resources scarcer, therefore more expensive, leading to population collapse? That was basically a thesis uh, developed by Thomas Malthus, an English clergyman uh, at the end of the 18th century. And he, what he was basically arguing is that over time, population will grow at a higher rate than production of food. And consequently, what we'll end up doing is that we are going to breed like rabbits. There will be too many of us, but there will be only so much grass, right. uh, which is the equivalent to natural resources. And eventually we will consume everything and then we will die off. And you can observe that in, in nature, animals, in right? Nature, so precisely. You can kind of understand where he's coming from. He's looking at Absolutely. Whether it's deer population or That's the biological whatever. outlook on life. The, yeah. the notion that after a particularly plentiful rain season, you've got a lot of grass, rabbits are having a ball until <laughs> there's so much of them that, you know, everything is depleted and they die. We take the, I, I would like to say, an economist view on this, together with Gail Pooley from BYU in, in Hawaii. What we are arguing is that human beings are different from... Uh, other uh, non-human animals in a sense that we have intelligence and we can uh, come up with ways of getting around the problem of scarcity. Uh, one of them is, of course, trade. So if uh, you have a famine in a country, you can buy food from other countries. But the other one is innovation. Develop fertilizer. Develop fertilizer, right? And there was a <laughs> unbelievable story in the Telegraph, uh, the, the British Daily what, about two or three days ago, it turned out that after the Battle of Waterloo, people went and dug up the skeletons of the 50,000 soldiers who have died during the Battle of Waterloo. Those bones were then ground up and used as fertilizer on English fields in order to feed the British population, right? Huh, that, that, that's very morbid. <laughs> that's very morbid. Of course, uh, corpses, feces, um, and so all sorts of other things were used as a fertilizer before. Then, at the beginning of the 20th century, we have developed synthetic fertilizer, which allows us to accomplish that and much more, which is why today in the world you can produce much more food per acre of arable land than ever before. Uh, we are producing around the world roughly 3,000 calories per person per day. So hypothetically speaking... For the whole planet. For, for the whole planet. So hypothetically speaking, we could feed the entire population of the world. That doesn't mean that every human being gets access to 3,000 calories per day. There is some wastage. Some people are too poor to, to, to buy 3,000 calories. But we are already producing that amount of food, and we can, we can go on producing it on ever smaller acreage of land. So the book Superabundance is really about this relationship between population growth and resource abundance. And resource abundance can grow at two speeds. 
it can grow at a slower rate than population, we just call that increasing abundance, or it can grow at a faster rate than population, and we call that superabundance. And so in the book, we looked at 18 different data sets, and we asked ourselves, at what speed do things become cheaper relative to income? And what we found was that uh, actually in all of these 18 data sets, abundance was increasing at a faster rate than population. So Malthus was wrong. He thought that population would be growing at a faster rate than, than food production. What we found was the exact opposite. What we found was that the production of resources is increasing at a much higher rate than population growth. And that's what we call superabundance. So you run hum the Human Progress Project, humanprogress.org, and on the website, there's a lot of honor paid to Julian Simon. Tell me about Julian Simon's description of resources. When you talk about increasing resources per person, what is a resource? So the first thing to understand about resources is that humanity today has exactly the same number of resources, the same amount of resources that a caveman had, you know, millions of years ago. The difference between our current prosperity is our knowledge, the fact that knowledge and insights into how the world operates have increased dramatically over the last few centuries. And therefore, we are able to accomplish with the resources we have much more than our ancestors could. And another way to think about resources would be to say that there are a finite number of atoms in the world. Those atoms could be atoms contained in copper or tin or plants or whatever. That number of atoms is finite. And we have exactly the same number of atoms on the planet as the caveman did, right? But we are much richer than them. And that's because of that knowledge, right? Uh, a typical example of that would be something like Bugatti Veyron. It's the most expensive car in the world and it costs about $18 million. It's when my, you, my son's favorite uh, matchbox car as a kid was the Bugatti. <laughs> He's like, oh, you got good taste. That's right. <laughs> and it, it's mine too, by the way. And uh, when you drive the Bugatti Veyron, again, a car worth $18 million, out of the car dealership, it costs $18 million. But when you then drive it into a wall, it is just a heap of plastic and metal that is worth maybe tens of thousands of dollars. The amount of atoms in both of these is exactly the same. Hmm, right. But the trick is that they've been differently arranged. One was arranged in a way that's worth $19 million, the other one was arranged in a way that costs only tens of thousands of dollars. And the difference between the two is, of course, knowledge. One of the things we've talked about on the show before, things that weren't considered resources for, for human use in the past, like gasoline was like a byproduct of kerosene production and was dumped into rivers. It was like, I don't know what to do with this stuff. It's just toxic. Let's just dump it in the river. And then it became, oh, maybe we can use this, this trash called gasoline in cars. <laughs> so like the thing that everyone's worried about today gas prices 150 years ago was just toxic waste. It had no value to humanity whatsoever. Correct, and it was the knowledge that has allowed humanity to first develop the combustion engine and then to realize that oil, or rather refined oil, gasoline, was the right way to power it in order to then accomplish other productivity gains. There was another side, side benefit to developing gasoline and other fossil fuels. And that is, of course, that in the past we used whales in order to create candles. So we were slaughtering these beautiful, huge animals in order to light our rooms and power our machines. And then suddenly we realized we no longer have to do that. So that's a perfect example of a substitution of one kind of resource for another kind of resource that also has environmental benefits in the long run. I recently came across something which is that the amount of human beings that die as a result of the climate mm -hmm. and, and, and weather and climate catastrophes has just collapsed over the past 100 years. That's correct. In the last 100 years, the death rate from extreme weather, earthquakes, floods, fires and things like that have declined by 99%, even though the world's population has obviously increased by a tremendous amount over the same period of time. So what does that tell us? Once again, I think uh, part of it has to do with knowledge. For example, we know, because we have satellites in the air, telling us which way a hurricane will progress so that we can advise people to move out of the way of the hurricane. We have uh, sensors at the bottom of the seas which tell us when there is an underground volcanic explosion so that people in low-laying areas on islands, for example, can be warned in advance that there's a tsunami coming 
and therefore they can move to a higher ground. We are rich and also more knowledgeable, which means that our buildings, which we are building today, are much less prone to collapse during an earthquake. They are, they are earthquake resistant. And so in all of these different ways, humanity, humanity's knowledge, intelligence, innovation, innovativeness has allowed us to actually fundamentally, I wouldn't go as far as to say conquer nature, but to be able to live with nature in a much safer way. That's part of the problem with a lot of the climate extremism is that a lot of people who are concerned about the climate simply assume that humanity, to go back again to the deer and the rabbits, is just going to stare at this problem that's coming our way and we are not going to do anything about it, we are not going to adapt and it's just going to overwhelm us. And that's not how human beings operate. We cannot predict the future, but we can definitely deal with problems as they come our way in, in, in a way that other animals cannot. There's this moment in time, which I know you are very familiar with and, and is in the book, where Julian Simon, the economist, makes this bet. That's right. And it captures a, you know, put your money where your mouth is moment for this idea. T tell me about the Simon bet. So we already talked about Thomas Malthus and his views and that particular work essay came out in 1798. But then, in 1968, Paul Ehrlich, who is a biologist at, at Stanford University, came up with an extremely popular book. It was called The Population Bomb. It sold something like three million copies, which for an author is just stratospheric. It's a yeah. beautiful thing. It was translated into goodness knows how many languages. And the famous opening of the book is that no matter what actions humanity takes today, 1968, by the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of millions of people will die due to starvation because we are going to run out of resources, including food, fuels, and so forth. Now, on the other side of the country, at the University of Maryland, there was an economist by the name of Julian Simon. Uh, Julian, unfortunately, died in 1998, but uh, he looked at the long-term data, and what he realized was that uh, over the long run, resources were actually becoming less expensive, adjusted for inflation, than he expected. He was expecting to find that resources were becoming more expensive. In fact, the opposite was true. And so he wrote papers, he wrote op-eds and things like that, and he was completely ignored because of this human propensity toward negativity, this brain that we have, which is looking out always on things to fear. Um, Ehrlich got much more coverage than Simon got. And so eventually Simon did the only thing which was left to him to do and that is to challenge Ehrlich to a bet. He told Ehrlich, you choose any commodities you want and a period of time longer than one year, and if the prices of commodities go up, I will pay you. If the prices of commodities go down, you will pay me. So Ehrlich chose five metals. Um, I don't know if I can remember them all now, but it was like nickel, tin, tungsten, copper, and chromium, I think. Yeah, so all stuff that's used in like everything humans are making, cars and electronics and houses and pipes and you know, all kinds of important stuff. Right. More and people means using more of this stuff. Yeah, it's vital to remember that it was early who chose these five commodities. And so the bet was uh, started on September 29th, 1980. It ended on September 29th, 1990, and in spite of the world growing by about a billion people, the prices of these commodities adjusted for inflation dropped by 36%. So we're in this moment right now where we've got the highest inflation since the 1970s. Help me and help families and kids and dads <laughs> that are watching this understand the way the price of things relates to this conversation. Most people think that there are only two prices. Gail Pooley and I believe that there are three prices, so, so let me look at them in turn. There is the nominal price, which is what you see in the shop. You go to a shop today, you get a loaf of bread, let's say it's three dollars. That's the nominal price or the current price. Price in money. In price in money at this moment. A real price or uh, inflation adjusted price basically takes into account the fact that every year your dollar is worth less than it was worth the year before. And that's because generally over time governments print uh, more money and cause inflation, which over the last 30 or 40 years in the United States was about 2% per annum. So you've got to take that into account when you're looking at a real price or inflation adjusted price. So if I go to the grocery store 
Last year, my bag of groceries cost $100. This year, my bag of groceries cost, let's say, $102. Then it would mean that really prices haven't changed. Prices remain the same. And that's, for me as an individual, that assumes that I got a 2% raise. Exactly. So exactly. if I didn't get a 2% raise, prices, my, my, the value of my money went down. Absolutely. Okay. Although, as a general rule, over the lifetime of an individual, and also over the last 200 years for our species as a, as a whole, um, our incomes have usually grown in excess of inflation because of productivity growth. Okay, let's say that you are a uh, chicken farmer and you are able to produce $100 worth of chicken meat an hour. Five years from now, you are able to produce for the same length of work, that one hour, $120 uh, worth of chicken meat. That means that you have become 20% more productive, right? So as a general rule, what's been happening since the last bout of inflation in the late 1970s and the early 80s was that inflation maybe rose by about 2%, your income rose by about 3%, and so you were 1% richer because of general productivity growth, right? And so, so that's how people usually tend to think about inflation. So that's the nominal price and that's the real price or inflation-adjusted price. The third kind of price is, which is what uh, Gail and I have developed, is called the time price. And time price basically gets rid of the inflation calculations altogether. It is the cost of something relative to your wages. So let's say, for example, that uh, something costs you $20, but you are making $40 an hour. So that would mean that it has cost you 30 minutes of labor, right? Sure. If in 10 years' time, the same thing costs still $20, but you are now making $80 an hour, that will mean that your time price has declined to 15 minutes of labor. So the time price is really uh, the cost of something today relative to how much you're making per hour, relative to the cost of something 10 years from now relative to your hourly income. When I try to think about like what is a basic thing that you could look back in fairly long periods of time. I guess one way to think about it would be, how long does a typical American have to work today to have light mm -hmm. in the evening in their home for the month? The Nobel Prize winning economist, William Nordhaus, did exactly this sort of thing. And what he found was an hour of light some thousands of years ago would have cost about 40 hours of labor, meaning gathering all the wood. Right, right. Um, and, um, but it cost about 40 hours of work in order to produce one hour of light. In 1992, when his statistic comes to an end, an hour of light costs something like 0.0000012 seconds, right. okay, <laughs> in terms of labor. Now, what we did in superabundance we looked at uh, blue-collar workers in the United States, and we also looked at unskilled laborers. And we just wanted to see what happened to their standards of living over time. And we didn't want to come up with some sort of an average wage or a median wage because, you know, people could say, well, but, you know, we are very, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he skews the, the, that sort of thing. A typical example would be that in 1850, for the same amount of work that in 1850 a blue-collar worker in the United States could buy one pound of meat, he or she could buy seven pounds of beef in 2018. The same okay. amount of work that allowed you to buy one chicken in 1850 allowed you to buy 24 chickens in 2018. So that gives you a sense of the real appreciation in the standards of living for the poorest working Americans. So my grandfather comes to America from Sicily and he works on the docks in Philadelphia, and he spends an hour manually moving bags of, let's say, wheat off of a ship. His one hour of doing that work, you fast forward to today, same Sicilian working at the same dock, doing different stuff, but spending an hour is seven to 10 to 20 times richer. Absolutely. In real terms, in terms of what they can buy for themselves and their families. Yeah. Sugar, I think, was the one that fell most in price in the catalog of things that we looked at. I think for the same amount of work, let's say an hour of work, if that bought you a pound of sugar in 1850, uh, by 2018, that would have bought you about 200 pounds of, uh, of sugar. But we don't look at just stuff which is bad for you. Like uh, We look at beef, we look at chicken, we look at shrimp, we look at oranges, bananas, wood for, for building of houses. We look at oil, gas, all sorts of other things to give a picture 
of just uh, how much better off people are. And the beauty of time prices is, of course, that innovation translates itself not just in the fall of prices of commodities over the long run, but also in people's wages. You've got these three prices, the current, the inflation adjusted, and then the time price. When you're just looking at abundance of anything, let's say chicken, from the perspective of nominal or inflation adjusted prices, you're missing one fundamental component. Have your wages risen over the same amount of time? And if they have, at a faster rate, then the price of the product has been increasing, then you are becoming more abundant. So the time price really allows you to combine the productivity gains in the production of goods, but also the productivity gains in human labor. I think about the area where this is the easiest for me as a nerd to understand. When I first started, my first computer was like, a, I think it was a Packard Bell that my dad bought from Sears in 1992. It was a 486. And this watch is probably thousands of times faster and more capable. And in dollar terms, like a fourth or a fifth the price of that Packard Bell in 1992. Right, so the price of the computer has actually dropped in price, but also your income has increased. So when you were a student and your father gave you this present, you were possibly not even producing any wealth. You were a drag on his, on his, on his <laughs> income. But now you're earning decent money. So that's what the time price does. It allows you to look at the whole of, of, of the human experience. So I wanna come back to make sure the listener, the viewer understands the, the significance of that bet between Simon and sure. Ehrlich. So Simon says, pick your commodities, Ehrlich, five things that you think this population bomb disaster is going to make more scarce, more expensive for humans. He picks them, presumably trying to not pick ones that he thinks will favor Simon. And he loses the bet dramatically 10 years later. All the prices for all five have gone down. The inflation adjusted price dropped by 36%, the time price dropped by 40%. Wow. What should I conclude then from Simon's complete total winning against Ehrlich? And is there any nudging there? Like if it was at a different time, would he have lost because mm -hmm. of, uh, people hear about commodities, look at oil, like it was $2, now it's four, five, six dollars a gallon. Like how does that bet hold up? We believe that we improved on the bet because the bet between Simon and Early was based on only on inflation adjusted prices of these metals. They didn't take into account the increase in wages over that 10 year period. And that's why you have this discrepancy between inflation pr uh, adjusted prices dropping by 36%, but time prices dropping by 40%. I would say that the impact of the Simon Early bet was twofold. One, one, there was an impact and then the other one was that there was no impact at all. I think that a lot of the smart environmentalists stopped thinking about overpopulation as being a massive problem vis-a-vis -vis the availability of resources. In other words, just because uh, you have increases in population doesn't mean that you are going to run out of resources. In fact, it is the human intelligence and human innovativeness which is going to make the resources more abundant by uh, coming up with substitutes, by conserving them, by finding new sources of the same resources and so forth. But the environmentalist movement then switched to something else, and that was the problem of the sinks. And the notion is not that we have too few resources, but that we are consuming too many resources, which then have to be put somewhere. So for example, as a result of consumption of resources, you're going to have a lot of trash where you're going to put it, okay? okay. Are you going to put it in a big hole in the ground near a town which doesn't want it? Uh, are you going to flush it down a river which will then end up in an ocean? Are you going to burn it? In which case you're going to contribute to destroying the atmosphere. And <laughs> this is a reasonable concern. I mean, you, you, you can turn on the television or you can take yeah. a trip to in India and find these massive trash piles that poor people are sorting through. And that seems like a completely yeah. legitimate thing to be worried about. But one has to still realize that it was a very important win for Simon is that people no longer obsessed about the totality of the amount of resources in Earth, which as I explained, can be fashioned and refashioned in myriad of different ways. The problem now was that if anything, we are too rich and we are consuming too much, and then where are we going to put it? It turns out that 
the best way toward better environmental conditions is to become wealthy. Because when you look at rich nations around the world, they are usually the leaders in environmental quality. They are basically better stewards of the planet. 90% of all the plastic, for example, that flows into the world's oceans flows there from eight rivers in Asia and Africa. Because their environmental standards are so low, because they cannot impose draconian environmental standards on their populations because they are too poor, and generally because poorer people are much less concerned about the state of the environment than rich people are. Uh, you can think of good environment almost as a luxury good, in a sense that it is rich people who care about things like uh, the welfare of the birds and slots and whatever. Poor people eat them because that's the only thing that's on the menu. Then the question became, what are we going to do about the outcome of human activity? It turns out that it's an incredibly difficult problem to measure or even to define. Uh, latest study which came out about five years ago, it was a mega study of something like 4,000 studies, uh, was unable to even come with definition of what an appropriate sink is. I want to make sure I understand yeah. even that word. You're saying sink. What does that mean? the space into which the outcome of human economic activity then dissipates. So let's say that you are burning a lot of plastic and as a result of that there is more air pollution. So it is the atmosphere which is the sink for whatever it is that you are exuding from. from okay. um, so it's like the trash can. It's the trash can, <laughs> precisely. Let's say that you are using a lot of plastic and then you have to put it in a big hole then Earth becomes the sink for that human activity. So sinks are really the atmosphere, the Earth, the oceans. This reminds me of what I think is now probably the most popular manifestation of this airlift population bomb, and that is the Thanos snap. Yes. <laughs> so in The Avengers, the evil, uh, the evil mastermind Thanos is trying to eliminate half of the population of the galaxy. Yes. In the name of as he puts it, I think putting the galaxy in, on a sustainable balance, I mean, he really sounds kind of like an environmentalist, actually. A extreme environmentalist. Uh, no, no, not all of them are like that, but, but you're absolutely right. His, I think his phrase is half of, half of the population of the universe has to die for the other half to live. And that brings me to my second point about the outcome of the Simon Ehrlich wager is that whereas the smart environmentalists stopped worrying about the effect of population growth on the availability of resources or abundance of resources. The population in general, the general public, ordinary people like you and I, have not gotten the message. The That's why we're having this conversation right now. We uh, have to contribute to getting that message out. <laughs> absolutely. The people who don't have time to read books or catch up on the latest science, uh, people who have real jobs, they haven't heard of the Simon Ehrlich bet and as a result a lot of people simply continue to believe that an increase in population must eventually result in a depletion of natural resources and therefore population collapse. It is for that reason that movies like Avengers The Infinity War, I believe it was called, was so popular. I believe it was seen by one out of every five Americans. It made billions of dollars. But there were other movies uh, yeah. which were made about the same subject. Kingsman um, uh, oh, yeah. was one of them. Wally um, is another example. It's just uh, a planet covered in trash. and Inferno. And so a lot of people out there still continue to believe it, even though the environmental movement has to some extent moved away from it, at least the smart environmentalists. Now that in itself has negative consequences, one of which is that people are taking the negative correlation between population growth and abundance of resources into account when making parental choices. Yeah, I read that up to 50% of Zoomers, Gen Z, young, young people, are so worried about both climate change and the environment and this general ethos of catastrophe that they say they don't want to have kids of their own. And they're being told this by teachers and so-called academics and professors, like, oh, the most moral thing you can do is not have kids. If you take what you're saying seriously, the most moral thing you can do in some ways is have more kids. Because well, people bring with them all this creative, industrious, intellectual capacity to solve problems for others. Well, let's start with the value of every human being. Obviously, I, I, I love children. I think they're wonderful. You know, I think that having children is a great blessing, but there's more to it. That, that's just a personal level feeling, but there's a broader aspect to population growth and to having children 
which is very important. And that is that currently human beings are the only entities, only organisms, which are capable of generating new ideas. It is new ideas which are then translated into inventions. Those inventions then get tested in the marketplace to see what's useless and what's useful. And out of that market test, you end up with innovations, which then increase productivity growth, and productivity growth is just a synonym for rising standards of living. So having more people in the world is not just a beautiful feeling for a parent. It is also good for the, the economy and general progress of the human species, because human beings are the only entities capable of having ideas. It is very often difficult to disentangle how much of this anti-humanist, anti-natalist philosophy out there is caused by concern over natural resources specifically, and how much of it is connected to the general doom and gloom of the future of the planet, including, for example, climate change. Certainly there is anecdotal evidence that we have come across where in polling, parents who have decided not to have children will say things like, I cannot have children because I don't want to use up resources or because it's bad for the planet and things like that. Right. What we can say for certain is that environmental doom and gloom is already having an effect on current fecundity, on uh, our fertility rates which are collapsing throughout much of the world. Not so much in Africa, but in Europe, North America, and Asia, we see a tremendous decline in fertility rates. To give a couple of examples, in South Korea, the typical woman will expect to have one baby per lifetime. Uh, you need 2.1 just to keep the population stable. You need two for obvious reasons, but there is always that 0.1% chance that the child will die before they are able to procreate and so forth or maybe they are infertile. And so you need 2.1 children per woman per lifetime in order to keep the population stable. In places like Korea, it's one. In Japan, it's close to one. In Central and Eastern Europe, it's about 1.3. In the United States, it's about 1.7. Our population still is growing in large part because of immigration, if not the only part because of immigration. So decisions that parents make about how many children they should have is not created in a vacuum. It is created within, uh, within a certain biosphere of ideas. And many of those ideas are deeply pernicious because they say that more human beings are bad for the planet. And as a result, people we now know from polling and from surveys are choosing to have fewer children. The worst part of this, what I would call hysteria, one is the tremendous rise in child eco-anxiety. In yes. other words, uh, psychotherapists throughout the world are reporting parents and children coming in with these huge existential worries, existential angst about how to live in a world which is going to end. Now, the world could still end due to a nuclear conflict. It could end if we have an asteroid that wipe us, wipes us all out. But I would bet anyone that it's not going to end because the world is going to become one degree Celsius warmer than it already is. So that's Part of the problem is the problem of eco-anxiety. Well, other... the most extreme version of that, right, is people like Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. I mean, this, this apocalyptic mindset, it really is a, a sort of embrace of an animal nature, like a, a reptilian brain, oh, there's, I don't know what's in that dark cave, so I'm afraid of the unknown thing that is going on. I mean, it can drive you to become I, you know, in the worst case, is actually like murderous. I mean, I think there's been several instances of people who do horrific things, and when you read their crazy manifestos, they have this apocalyptic mentality below the surface, and it can sound left or right, but that apocalyptic mentality is really quite destructive. Indeed, in the book, we do go through cases of three or four mass shooters in the United States uh, the most infamous one uh, was at a Walmart in El Paso three or four years ago. The shooter killed quite a large number of people. I can't quite recall how many, but the point is that he left behind him a uh, memorandum or a testament in which he said that people are using too many resources and therefore we need to s start culling humanity in order to make the world more livable for other people. You can see how the, the sort of large sections of the population who are not paying attention have not noticed that the debate has moved on, but still continue to believe in this Malthusian slash Ehrlichian nonsense 
can create an atmosphere where deeply troubled young men, and it's usually young men, Usually will, fatherless young men at that. <laughs> will, will end up doing something so horrific as shooting up a Walmart uh, because they believe that we're just using too many resources and simply not true. Resources are becoming cheaper over time, which means they are becoming less scarce. I want to end this part of our conversation with a quote from Thanos himself. He says at one point in the movie, little one, it's simple calculus. The universe is finite, its resources are finite. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correction. That's Thanos from the Avengers and the Infinity War. You could find almost the exact same claim in a viral video called The Story of Stuff that was made with, I think, the Sierra Club's funding and is in like almost every school. This cute little animation where this exact Thanos sort of evil villain line is delivered to kids as young as kindergarten. So we have a long way to go to try to correct this misconception. Part of that, I think, is also making the case empirically. So you have ways of trying to measure abundance, and we've talked about the time price. How in the book and how through your work have you measured the data? Like, how do we know this for a fact? In order to calculate the time price, you just need two things. You need the current price or the nominal price of a good and the prevailing hourly wage rate in year one, and then could compare it to a current or nominal price of a good in a store in year 10. And you, you just need also the prevailing wage rate at that, at that time. And uh, so long as the wages of people are growing at a faster pace than uh, the price of a good, everything is becoming more abundant. Now, this wouldn't be the case, obviously, if uh, resources were becoming more expensive with population. Don't forget the very famous movie made in 1974, I think, with Charlton Heston called Soil and Green. <laughs> right, right. They're people. Yeah, and, and, and so Soil and Green, uh, the funny thing is that Soil and Green is supposed to take place in 2022, this year. So the movie was made in the early 70s. Right. I, I don't think it's coincidental, by the way, that the movie is made only six years after Population Bomb comes out. Right, Population well, Bomb not. comes out in 1968, and yeah. you got Soil and Green in 1974. That's uh, about how long it takes to get a movie made from, <laughs> I have this great idea, I just read this book, to it's on the silver screen. Right, uh, well, that's very interesting. I didn't know about the production processes in, 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 in your industry. And then uh, people watch it, and it scars and it scares generations of people. But what is the premise of, of Soil and Green? Is that eventually we have so many people and so little food that every time a human being dies, he or she is converted into biscuits called soil and green, which are then fed to the people who are still alive, right? So that's an extreme example of how people in the past, not so long ago, only 50 years ago, yeah. really thought that resources would be so expensive that you would have to kill people in order to, kill, uh, to keep other people alive. Today, well, let me give you an example. Even though the federal minimum wage is only about seven and a half dollars, roughly 90% of American workers who work on a minimum wage anywhere in the country now make between 12 and 15 dollars an hour, right? So the minimum wage is really approaching very fast 15 dollars per hour for most American workers. And just because this is such a hot button, just so people understand this, and I think for a lot of people, they can see this driving around. Like, if I go to the Chick-fil-A down the street, there's a sign that says, we are paying $18 an hour plus benefits and vacation time. And that is because they are desperate to hire anyone willing to work. Yes. And so they, they're, charged, they're offering way more than the government requires them. Yeah, last time I looked at this was uh, about four years ago. And even then, 90% of workers working on a minimum wage were taking in about $12 an hour. So by now, it has to be $15 and more for a vast majority of workers, once again, stipulating working on a minimum wage. Now, a Costco chicken, whole rotisserie chicken, costs $5, which means that for an hour of work on a minimum wage, you can get three rotisserie chickens from Costco which together contain about 3,500 calories, which is far more than you need in order to function on a daily basis. So how do I make my point that things yeah. have become cheaper? One way to look at it would be to say a blue-collar worker over the last 200 years or so for the same amount of work, instead of one chicken, he can afford 24 
Another way to look at it would be to say that a worker on a minimum wage in the United States can afford three rotisserie chickens for an hour of work on a minimum wage. If this is not abundance, I don't know what is. Well, it's funny that you should say that, right? Because it, it was either Ro Roosevelt or Hoover during the Depression who said what we want, what we want to achieve is a, is a chicken in every pot. Wasn't that the phrase? Uh, now, uh, I think it was Roosevelt, but here's the key. Believe it or not, that was quite a promise. Throughout history, people didn't used to eat chickens for a simple reason, that by killing of a chicken and eating it, you were destroying the, 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 the source of your secondary food item, which was eggs. So people mostly ate eggs, uh, but they very seldom ate chickens. Even by the 1950s, chicken was still considered to be quite a luxury item. And so by making this promise in the late 1930s, whenever Roosevelt made it, he was literally promising um, a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the moon. The moon, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Several years back, my wife Lisa and I made a movie about the way animals are raised for food called At the Fork. And I'm, I'm like a mostly vegetarian. So for the vegetarians out there who hear us talking about meat and chicken and say, we, don't, we shouldn't be eating any of these animals. Let's put our abundance in vegetarian terms, if you will. How, how has abundance impacted everything else? As well, we, we have good news for the pescatarians, uh, which is that uh, shrimp and salmon, for example, are much more affordable than what they were decades ago. And we have very good news for the vegetarians, uh, because when we looked at the prices of things like potatoes, rice, oranges, bananas, wheat, for example, all of them have fallen in price quite dramatically. We have this moment right now where the world was locked down, the ability to trade internationally, you know, was deeply damaged, it feels like there's, reg there's regression happening right now. For the viewer who says, this seems like BS, <laughs> I just filled my tank and it cost over a hundred bucks for my truck, and the price of everything feels like it's going up, and the availability of stuff on the shelves is in decline. I'm waiting months and months to get an Ikea kitchen. <laughs> What's happening there? How, do, how should I understand the moment we're in right now? I think that's Thinking about it as a, as a problem of temporary regression is not a ba bad way to think about it. The American economy, not to mention the global economy, is an infinitely complicated machine. You mess with it and you're going to get some very nasty consequences. It took us decades of trade liberalization, regulation reform and so forth to get to a place where the world economy was functioning as well as it did. The oil market was really, really tight. You know, the, the, there was a lot of oil flowing into the global economy. The profit margins were small because there was so much competition. There was a lot of production, there was a lot of consumption, but it worked because over the decades, the global economy was able to, to become more sophisticated and more interdependent. With COVID and especially with shutdowns and the government's reaction to COVID. They haven't broken the global economy, but they have certainly damaged it. A lot of these links which allowed this incredibly complicated machine to function as smoothly as it did got broken. And it's going to take some time for those linkages, for those efficiencies to be reconstituted in order to produce higher rates of economic growth. That's the supply shock, okay? We have shut down the world's economy and consequently the world economy was producing much less stuff both physical goods, but also services. Then there was the fiscal shock, which is that the government has printed a lot of money and it has borrowed a lot of money. So it's a double shock. On the one hand, you are printing a lot of money and you're borrowing a lot of money and you are sort of spraying it like from a huge fire hose at the population. And on the other hand, you are decreasing production. So the massive gap had opened between how much the economy is produced, but how much money is in circulation. And the gap between the two that's your inflation. It's more money chasing fewer goods. I saw a recent statistic that it isn't the case that the supply of goods and services is still going down. Like we are producing more, just not as fast as we could have. And the claim that, oh, well, all of the price increases we're seeing in our daily lives is just because of Russia or or whatnot, doesn't hold any water really because it's all, it's really all the money printing. Not, not with me, uh, prices in the United States started rising before Russia invaded Ukraine. The invasion of Ukraine certainly has played a role in uh, 
uh, increasing inflation in the United States to a 40-year high. Incontinent uh, monetary and fiscal policy has certainly contributed to it. Other things that happened was, of course, that once people had all this money, they didn't feel particularly pressured to return into the working place. When that happens, then companies which could be producing stuff, including oil and gas, and baby um, formula. <laughs> those people haven't returned to work. And as a consequence, the, the productivity snapback has not been as speedy and as steep as it could have been if those people were simply ready to go into the workplace. They'll stay have, they still have savings. With the baby formula, my understanding is that part of the problem was some sort of quality issues at Abbott Laboratories, which produce it. But here again, it is the government which should get a very large chunk of the blame for where we are, and I'll tell you why. When it comes to uh, the baby formula, we are prohibiting European baby formula coming to the United States. And that's crazy. Europe is not a third world continent. There are no streets in European cities strewn with dead babies because they've all been poisoned by the domestically produced baby formula. Why can we not have this baby formula in the United States? Because the FDA hasn't approved it. That to me seems crazy. I think that developed nations with very high levels of safety and protection for their populations should have mutual recognition of products, which is to say that if something is safe enough for the Europeans to consume, it should be safe enough for the Americans to consume. We are not that different. I want to turn our attention to the people who stand in the way, maybe ignorantly, maybe they have a kernel of truth, maybe they're actively malevolent. You title it in the book, Human Flourishing and Its Enemies. There's a lot of people out there that have that Thanos feeling. Who are these people? What's driving the fact that this conversation, which is based in like massive amounts of observable reality, there's now 7 billion people on planet Earth, more of whom are living better even now than the population just 50 years ago. And that is like a controversial, almost heretical thing to talk about today. Why? Let me first correct you. There are 8 billion of us now. Oh, yeah, <laughs> right. So, <I'm... laughs> but um, I don't think it's a it's a it's a it's a one problem here. I mean, we already talked about the mass shooters in the United States who simply by uh, reading the wrong stuff decided that the best way they could help help the planet was by killing a lot of people. But there are others who I think have just as deep but but different psychological problems. Sometimes it's a tremendous dissatisfaction with the world and almost a death wish because they believe that the world hasn't lived up to its fullest potential as understood by the people who hold these beliefs. So you have a lot of people amongst uh, extreme environmentalists who despise humanity because they have an image of what the world should be like, of what humans should behave like. When you are this disgusted with your fellow human beings, then it is not difficult to imagine that people like that, with that kind of attitude, are prone to apocalyptic visions of the future, not just observing those apocalyptic predictions, but also wishing for them. There's a paper in the book that we uh, talk about which finds that apocalyptic predictions are not just uh, popular amongst the religious, but also non-religious. Amongst the religious, apocalyptic predictions and signs of an apocalypse, let's say the outbreak of the COVID pandemic, could reinforce their previously held religious beliefs, which is to say that everything is going to end. Um, sure. and, and that sort of reinforces the, the, this vision of the world that I have acquired through religious texts, which says that apocalypse is coming. So in a sense, I am correct. But this is not just the religious people. The secular people are also prone toward uh, believing in the apocalypse because extreme environmentalism has replaced traditional religion in their minds. It is a different type of religion, but it is still a religion. It is an all-encompassing view of the world where the God is replaced by Gaia, where the devil is replaced by the fossil fuel company, where the saint is replaced by Greta Thunberg. Paying the church to forgive your sins is replaced by green offsets, where every time that Leo DiCaprio flies across the ocean, he gives a few thousand dollars to a green NGO, and therefore his great sin against the environmental religion is forgiven. So apocalypse can also be very soothing to secularists because it also reaffirms their vision of the world 
their value system. It's become, I think, more understood that recycling mostly is nonsense and it doesn't even go into processing, but today it literally goes into the same trash as the trash bin, but we still have this like, it's like a practice. <laughs> Rolling it down, oh, oh, okay, here's a plastic. I'm gonna throw this in this separate trash can that'll end up being put in the same trash. I feel better. Yeah. But now I feel better. These payments, these sort of indulgences, they have a kind of medieval Catholic church <laughs> kind of quality to them. Like, oh, well, I've, I'm a terrible person, but I can pay a couple indulgences and now I'm, now I'm great. It's not a charitable way to describe this belief though. So what's the most charitable way we can understand somebody who looks at this conversation, looks at our general optimism and says, you guys are deluded. The world is in much worse shape than you're, than you're claiming it is. What's the most charitable read you, know, you have to offer for, for that perspective? Well, I would say that the people who rejoice in the apocalypse are the extreme environmentalists who drive our children to eco-anxiety and so forth. They are exhibiting a very human feature, the need for religion, the, the need for transcendence. Human beings are the only animal on earth capable of envisaging its own demise. We are the hmm. only animal capable of understanding that one day we are going to die. No other animal can, can do that. And uh, this is scary. It's weird. Other animals don't have to worry about these things. And They're obviously so, afraid of death and, and, and at a base level, you you know. And in the moment when they are threatened, yeah, they, they, but, they're going yeah. to run away, but... They, They're not they, thinking about the they, afterlife. They don't, they don't <laughs> think about it throughout their entire uh, conscious lives that, you know, at, at some point there is going to be an end. We have to cope with that end and being aware of that end in some ways. And the way that human beings have dealt with it in the ages past was by developing religion, some sort of a belief or where you are going after death, be it the Eleusian fields for the Greeks, heaven for the Christians, and so forth. And even if a religion didn't have a specific afterlife to go to, it still provided a structure for a daily life and communal living. With the decline of traditional religion, the religious impulse is not going anywhere. I'm an atheist, so I can talk about it in a completely unemotional way. The religious impulse doesn't go anywhere. It just has to be channeled in different ways. J.K. Chesterton famously says that when people start believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. Hmm. And so you've got these new religions which are springing up, quasi-religions. The, the structure of the extreme environmentalist movement, um, it, to, to compare it to Christianity is very easy, as I said, with its devils and its, and its, um, and its saints and so forth. People can channel that need for transcendent and, no, transcendence. Some people can have children and then see their immortality through them. Other people can seek trans, transcendent, transcendence <laughs> through their work, writing books for example. Sure. Other people will do it by developing and embracing new types of religion, uh, which will enable them to cope with the, with, with the struggles of daily, daily life, uh, developing ways of coping, uh, developing ways of structuring your day. You know, this morning I have to make myself a kale smoothie, then I have to separate my trash, then I have to do a yoga and things like that. Whether these people have a belief in, in, in some sort of a supernatural Mother Gaia or not, it's still a quasi-religious way of organizing your daily life, which is very comforting to people to have a routine. People don't like chaos. I'm gonna read a quote which speaks to this in a very real way in your book. It's from Steven Pinker. He, he writes, Left-wing and right-wing political ideologies have themselves become secular religions, providing people with a community of like-minded brethren, a catechism of sacred beliefs, a well-populated demonology, and beatific confidence in the righteousness of their cause. That's Steven Pinker. And so that, I mean, that mirrors exactly you know, your, your per perspective here. I, I think Steven might also be an atheist or agnostic. So I, I want to offer maybe a different possible perspective. And one that I don't entirely, I don't reject necessarily. And that is, we have this enormous amount of technological and material progress because we're these big brained creatures that come up with new ideas. And even the process itself is bizarre. You know, you have like, you wake up one morning and there's a new idea in your head that wasn't there before. Like, where did that come from? <laughs> 
but we do it, the more people, the more big brained creatures walking around, the more likely we're gonna solve problems like cancer and long lasting batteries and whatnot. But we do see something else happening. And it's not just environmental catastrophizing. And that is the wealthiest societies in the world, the United States being the leading among them, do have in many cases relatively high rates of suicide. Scandinavia has the highest rates of suicide in Europe, but they're comparable to the United States. We have social isolation, some of which is because of these screens that we have. And we aren't really a different animal than we were 150,000 years ago. We're the same no, we creature. Yeah. How do we navigate this super abundant world? And how do you think about the challenge of finding happiness or finding purpose, fulfillment? You know, the Greeks called it eudaimonia, like this like rich, deep sense of satisfaction and purpose. When it does seem like modernity is, it's not all upside for, for the human psychology. <laughs> Well, the first thing I would say is that I try to outline ways in which in a secular society you can still find meaning in life. One would be having a family, having children, and again, sort of see posterity, see immortality through them. I'm passing down my genes, if you just want to be completely secular about it. The other thing would be to engage in work and leave behind you a uh, something that is um, long-lasting. Uh, but of course, what we are witnessing in the world today is that people who don't have the traditional religion in their lives, like you have your Catholic faith. Um, by the way, I was brought up a Catholic. I was even an altar boy. Um, <laughs> so you don't have traditional religion in your life. Then maybe you don't have any work. And we know that unemployment is... Especially amongst men. It's terrible. It's, it's terrible. like It's like getting diabetes if, you have, if you're yeah, unemployed. Yeah, uh, I mean, our share of labor force uh, is something like... 62% um, of Americans are in the labor force, it should be much higher. So we know there are a lot of people who don't have their traditional faith, who don't have work to do. Perhaps as a result of that, they also have no hope of finding a mate and having children. And I think that it is this particular group of people that we have to worry about because it is out of that group that we, we, we see the emergence of mass killers or people who are potentially likely to commit mass, mass murders. The disaffected, the ones who feel they don't, they don't have any hope, uh, but also the ones who live their lives in such a way that uh, they have no hope. So your book is Super Abundance, and you've laid out how through ideas, through innovation, through institutions, uh, that that explosion of abundance is possible. And then we have to grapple with this next level problem now, how do you see humanity's relationship with superabundance evolving as we move forward? The key to understanding the relationship between population and innovation is that you are going to have a much higher likelihood of having an innovator or an inventor in a population of 8 billion people than in a population of 8 million people. At the time of Christ, there was only 300 million people in the entire world. Now, assuming that the share of the population capable of producing inventions and innovations is more than maybe 5%, maybe lower than that, you're going to have very many fewer inventors in a population of 300 million as opposed to 8 billion. So in that sense, by maintaining population where it is and hopefully even growing it a little, we can increase the potential of having the geniuses who will come up with life-saving drugs, better technology, um, and whatever. And then, then once you do that, uh, you're of course creating a much better world for the rest of us. I know that uh, when people talk about superabundance, they tend to sort of think about Western advanced societies and uh, people will say things like, oh, well, maybe we have enough. We don't need anymore. Well, oh, maybe. I don't personally buy it because every Western person I've ever met wanted to have more not just a bigger house, but also maybe an extra holiday to Hawaii, you know, nicer car, um, an extra TV in the kitchen and things like that. So there's plenty of desires that Western society still has to cater to. But don't forget the billions of people around the world who are nowhere near our standards of living. GDP per capita in China is something, something like $10,000. In the United States, our median household income is about $65,000. So even though the Chinese economy is as large as ours, maybe even bigger, they are six times poorer than we are. In India, that's one and a half billion people right there. GDP per capita is something like two or three thousand dollars a year. So they're 20 times poorer than we are. So there's still a long way to go. 
So what is superabundance? Superabundance is a book that says that people are not making resources scarcer. On average, human beings are build more, create more than they consume or destroy. And that the more people we have, the more likely it is that we are going to end up with the kinds of innovations and inventions which are going to create tremendous prosperity, not just for the people in the West, but also for people in poor countries. Superabundance is a book that tries to put these things in an empirical way tries to estimate how much people, how much better off people are. But it also makes a moral claim, and that is that there is an inherent dignity to every human being uh, because ultimately we are creators rather than destroyers. On average, in the long run, but still. This is a book that is profoundly pro-human. It is a humanistic book, very much in the same line of the thinkers of the Enlightenment who put the human flourishing at the very heart of human enterprise. I know, you know, from our, we had dinner last night and talked a little bit about, about our backstories that you're an immigrant to the United States. How do you think about America and your role? You know, all of us play a role in our, our story and I think in the American story and as a first generation immigrant in particular. How do you think about your role in the American story? Well, it's, um, it's difficult for me to think about um, America in some ways, and it's very easy to do in other ways. Obviously, America as such has provided me with uh, tremendous opportunities, and I enjoy my life here, and I have um, I've made a lot of friends, and I appreciate the fact that I was given the opportunity to make a living, make a home, enjoy a nice standard of living. To think about America in, in a slightly different way is more difficult because there is no such thing as one America. Uh, we are a country beyond, uh, diverse beyond imagination. There is the geographic differentiation of America, different culture in the South versus Northeast. We have obviously uh, diverse ethnicities and races, different religions. And I think that America is going through a particularly unfortunate period in its history where America has lost confidence in itself and also in the future. You know, this country used to be very optimistic and now on both left and right of the political spectrum, all we hear is pessimism and doom and gloom. Yes. Which kind of makes sense from a political standpoint, because of course when Republicans are in charge, you don't want Democrats to be saying, oh, well, they're not doing such a bad job, <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, they're, they're destroying our democracy. They're destroying the world. And then when uh, Democrats are in charge, you'll never hear about the things that Democrats may be doing right because the Republicans have an incentive to paint it as though the world is coming to an end. And so... They're bringing about communism. <laughs> and, and, and so there is no constituency in the United States right now, a large constituency, uh, which is basically saying that uh, uh, neither of these two extremes is actually correct. Things could be going better, but things could go much, much worse. You are familiar with the law of entropy. Uh, the chances of creating something enduring, working, functional, is much higher than for things to break apart because things and systems have a natural tendency toward chaos, toward dissolution. And so that's a long way of saying that I've come to America at a, at a time when there's a lot of negativity and the kind of optimism that people had about the future, perhaps uh, in the 1960s, is tough to come by. On the other hand, I'm kind of bullish on the United States in the long run because the United States has shown time and time again that it is able to reconstitute itself and to grow. United States after the War of Independence was a basket case with a worthless currency, you fix that. United States after uh, the Civil War was a, a basket case with a dysfunctional currency, you fix that. You know, America bounced back from the Great Recession, uh, sorry, from the Great Depression, and America has uh, bounced back from the very nasty 1970s. Uh, 1980s and 1990s were excellent times in American history. So I think that America is able to, is able to correct ship, and uh, I, I fully expect that to happen in the future. But for that to happen, we also need to have leaders who don't just about the other party all the time, <laughs> but leaders who will present us with a broadly optimistic vision of the future. It may not have the sort of sweet, honey-toned overtones of Reagan's Morning in America kind of campaigns, but I can see an American candidate 
uh, I had a few in mind, but I won't mention them, uh, who would say, we are sick and tired of growing at one and a half or 2% per year. I want a growth of three or three and a half percent, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change the regulatory structure in the federal government so that it's easier to build and to explore. I'm going to change the uh, tax system in the country so it doesn't penalize work. There's a lot that could be done, but I think what we, what we need is a candidate and, and hopefully a political movement that is broadly speaking optimistic, that sees in technology and innovation tremendous potential for improving the daily lives of ordinary Americans. That's maybe your most optimistic thing you've said in this entire conversation. <laughs> I'm sorry if I was so pessimistic. I uh, usually uh, am quite optimistic. I, uh, I, and I, what I mean by that is uh, hope in politics is, um, it springs eternal. <laughs> so I, uh, I, But I wouldn't be making those statements if I hadn't seen this country go through similar, uh, similar peaks and valleys before. Marion, thank you so much for coming on Dad Saves America. I think this was a really interesting conversation and I'm really looking forward to uh, your book, Super Abundance. We had the benefit of getting it early. Everybody needs to read this book. It's a really important contribution to our understanding of the world. Thank you very much. It's been a delight. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Marion Tupi. And I encourage you to check out his book, Super Abundance. We'll put a link down below. My key takeaway from this conversation is that Julian Simon's message still rings true. In spite of all the apocalyptic predictions we're bombarded with, as a species, we continue to thrive. And as parents, that optimistic message is crucial to instill in our kids and to remember for our own sanity as well. The best way you can help us get this optimistic message out is to share this video with your friends and family. And as always, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you won't miss our videos as they come out each week. At Dad Saves America, we believe that dads are heroes who play an essential role in overcoming the challenges we all face together. And now I leave you with a dad doing something positively awesome. Did it scare you or did it hurt you? The drop-in was amazing, you know that, right? Sometimes we just slip out on the ramp. What if I fall again? Well, I'm kind of scared and I really want to do it. Sometimes it's scary doing hard things and it's totally up to you whether you want to give it a go right now. Well, I'm scared that I'm going to fall. We can skip this. You don't have to do this. I want to. Whoa, it's... It's okay. <laughs> well, okay. Okay. Okay, so okay. I'll do it. One, two, three. That was a great job doing that after falling. It's really brave. And is my foot okay back Yeah, there? it looks amazing. And then just lean forward and stomp and bend your knees. And I'll be here in case you fall. Mm -hmm. You promise you'll touch me? So do your thing and I will be here the whole process. Here and here and here and here and here okay. and here.